Hello and welcome to Model Aviation Live. I'm your host, Jay Smith. I'm the executive editor of Model Aviation and Park Pilot Magazines. And I'm excited to talk to you a lot today about books. I'm actually in my home office where I usually shoot this show, but I have uh, changed the viewpoint because I'm kind of excited to share with you just really quick. I've got a bookshelf right behind me that's about 110 years old. And I picked it up on New Year's Eve. I drove all the way to Chicago, which for months is about a four hour drive each way. So an eight hour round trip and picked up it's a globe worm key bookcase and as i said we're going to talk a little bit about books and we have an author as our guest today so i just thought it'd be neat to show the the bookshelf uh off it, the bookshelf behind me was made in columbus ohio which is about uh, two hours from here it's roughly 110 years old uh, and it's made out of quarter sawn oak but what's really cool about it is it's modular so if you if you're looking behind, if you look behind me, each shelf is separate and you can pick it up and take it off the bookshelf. So it's, you know, a typical bookshelf obviously is just one solid piece. But this bookshelf, each shelf is separate that you can pick up and move. You don't even have to take the books out if you choose not to. And the other neat thing about it is the shelves can be different sizes. So you can have a, one that's for paperbacks and one that's for hardbacks. So it's actually the third bookshelf in this room in my home office it's the third bookshelf that's how much i enjoy books a large majority of those of course are aviation books but uh i was in need of a bookshelf and i love history and i found out about these modular uh bookcases a lot of times they're referred to as barrister bookcases and so i was really excited to be able to have this um to house my books now since we're talking about books as you know oftentimes we review books in worth a closer look that involve aviation and we are having an author on shortly on the show but what else is interesting that i want to share with you is we've just brought on a new columnist for model aviation magazine who's going to write about free flight and that columnist is an actual illustrator for covers of books and this gentleman has illustrated stephen king clive cussler i mean he's done like 1500 books so far. So that's a really exciting thing. Obviously, we know that our, our members, you know, come from all walks of life. And it was really exciting to hear his involvement. So I got to chat with him earlier this week about it's, what it's like to illustrate um, covers for so many different types of books. And oftentimes, when I talk to uh, someone that owns a company and say, I'll say to them, what is it like to go to an air show, an RC air show, or any type of, of modeling show and see your aircraft? And so I asked the illustrator, I said, what's it like to go into a Barnes and Noble or a Walmart or a Target and see your books? And uh, he shared, you know, an exciting story that, you know, it's still thrilling to do that. So I'm really looking forward to us working with him going forward. And uh, he will be taking over Dennis Norman's column. Um, as some of you may know, sadly, Dennis passed away. And so the, our new columnist will take over um, handling that part of free flight, that Dennis free flight scale. And his name is uh, Tom Hallman. And while I'm on the topic of, of books, I also want to mention to you that there is an upcoming book that we will be getting for review. And I'm really excited about it. And the book is about the Battle of Britain movie. And if you've watched the show regularly, you may recall that I actually have a uniform from the movie, a screen-worn uniform from the Battle of Britain movie. It was worn by Ian McShane, who played a pilot, Sergeant Andy Moore. And I bought it from Planet Hollywood when they were downsizing. So I'm already interested in the movie uh, because I like aviation. And then I was able to get the uniform. But even probably more important for our audience is the fact that that was the first movie, as far as we know, where they flew RC airplanes you know, not just static models, but flying RC models in an aviation film. So I'm really excited to get a copy of the book from our friends at Casemate. Uh, the book is going to be out in August, and uh, it's supposed to tell the whole story of making the Battle of Britain. So I'm hopeful that there'll be some good information in there about making the movie as far as the models are concerned. And while I'm touching on the models, there were actually three builders who built the RC models for the movie. And sadly, Two of them are passed away, but T Dave Platt was one of the three that made the uh, models for the movie. And I talked to Dave about that about a year ago or so, and he shared some really interesting stories about building the models for that movie. So you will see this book review in Worth a Closer Look after that uh, book comes out. But while we're focused on books and we're focused on Worth a Closer Look, let's talk about there's a book review that I did for the March 
of 2022 issue. So obviously you haven't seen this yet. It's a sneak peek. But I did a book review on a book called Restoration Force. And it's a very interesting book. The book is about people, not museums, but people who buy mainly cockpits from airplanes. But sometimes it can be more than that. But private collectors who buy these aircraft and restore them. And the whole book talks to them about what that's like, um, what's involved. You know, it showcases their projects. So there's actually a gentleman that owns a cockpit of a Hawker Hurricane that was in the Battle of Britain. There's jets. There's all kinds of interesting information uh, in this book. So I'm a collector myself. Um, I collect autographs, books, movie props. Uh, there's a lot of things that I collect. I don't have uh, the space for a cockpit of an airplane, but I could certainly appreciate that. In fact, really quick, I, I shared a story at the beginning of the review that reading this book brought me back to my childhood. And when I was in elementary school, I had a teacher who owned, lived in a log cabin and her husband owned a pool company and they had an amazing pool in this log cabin. And so she invited all her students to a pool party at the end of the school year. And when I went to her house, there was a Cessna, just a fuselage, no wing, but the Cessna underneath the carport. And I spent part of the party just sitting in the Cessna in the cockpit pretending I was flying it. You know, again, I'm I think I was about uh, fifth grade at the time. And uh, so anyway, I, I related that in this review that that brought back that memory when we talk about all these people who restore these aircraft or at least the fuselages and uh, you know, maybe it's in their garage or in their house or in their um, yard or, you know, who knows, garden. And what's neat is the book shares stories of people all around the world. Uh, I believe the author actually lives in England, but it talks about projects all over the world. So look for that in the March issue in Worth Closer Look. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about the book review I did in the December issue of Worth a Closer Look. And it was all about British aircraft of World War I. And this article was actually, or this book, excuse me, was actually written by our guest that we're going to have on the show today. He's actually written for Model Aviation Magazine. He wrote an article on detailing your ARF. He did a review on the Maxford Newport 17. And he also wrote an article on aircraft repair. And he also writes books on World War I aviation. This one being British fighter aircraft in World War I. His name is Mark Wilkins, and I'd like to invite him to the show. Hey, Mark. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Hi there. How are you well, doing? Good. Thank you. you. Pretty good. Happy to be here. <laughs> well, welcome to the show. Uh, really excited to have you on and talk about you both your modeling career and then your, your writing. So, but it probably makes sense maybe to start with your modeling career. So obviously you and I've talked several times over the years. Uh, I think the first time you wrote for us was all the way back in 2014, but could, uh, for the viewers, could you, uh, kind of take us through how you got involved in model aviation? Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Um, started like, like many people started at a very young age, uh, fascinated by airplanes, fascinated by flight, um, lived outside, grew up outside of Washington, D.C., so my dad would take me into the uh, National Air and Space Museum all the time, and uh, I love staring at the Spirit of St. Louis. I would, I would spend, it seemed like hours, just staring at that airplane, imagining it flying across the Atlantic and Charles, Charles Lindbergh's uh, very solitary and uh, historic flight. Anyway, um, of course, building scale models came out of that, um, and then I remember uh, as, a <laughs> as a child trying I was too young, trying to build those gullows, tissue paper and balsa wood airplanes. And they look great. I painted them, you know, very scale. But they, fl they flew terribly. I, I, <laughs> I guess I wasn't up on my, uh, my flight principles or whatnot because they always seemed tail heavy. They always seemed underpowered, uh, too heavy. And uh, anyway, <laughs> that's how that started. And um, from that, of course, U-Control uh, grew out of that. And of course, the... Uh, holy grail of all of it, which is RC. Back then there was very, very limited options. Um, I remember I was telling Jay uh, earlier that there was a, a Cox PT-17 with a 049 engine that was RC. And I remember taking it to a ball field really early in the morning so that nobody would be there, firing up the engine. I didn't even know what I was doing. I remember taking it off and it just kept on <laughs> going. I don't, I don't know where it ended up, but it, it never came back to me. Um, I just thought that 
I just thought that somehow it, I would get it in the air and I would fly it and everything would be fine. But uh, that's when I realized it's a lot tougher uh, in reality than, than I imagined it to be. Um, and then jumping forward, I was actually in DC working for the Smithsonian at this point. And uh, I got a, I don't know where I got it. It was a kit of a cub, a Piper cub. Uh, with a big old uh, nickel cadmium battery. It was an electric. It was one of the early electrics. And I had a big battery uh, pack in it. And there again, it was, uh, I took I took it to, finished it, took it to a ball field. And, uh, you know, it took off. I, I brought it around. I turned it around the reversal. I got that part right. And then I guess I had a brain freeze. It flew over the tree line and uh, ended up in the road. Lucky it didn't uh, go through someone's windshield. Anyway, <laughs> That was my sort of uh, unglamorous indoctrination into RC. Now, I was telling Jay when when uh, technology and uh, equipment and transmitters and receivers became so much more accessible, reliable, and affordable, um, I got back into it, and uh, it's been nothing but a pleasure ever since to uh, to uh, build and fly those airplanes. So, um, does that answer your question? <laughs> it, it does, but we we also. Want to talk about you seem to gravitate to world war one where did where did that interest come in yeah that's so i was in grad school and uh getting my my graduate degree in history and one of the best classes i took was on the first world war and it was just a a fascinating it still captivates me the whole thing i mean from the politics to the, the battles to the technology all of it coalescing at the same time on the western front it just captivated my imagination and the aircraft uh, it was like the Wild West of aviation. I mean, really, uh, these people uh, climbing into these airplanes, they barely knew how to flew and then trying to do battle. Uh, the planes themselves weren't that strong. They got stronger as the war went on, but um, very much an experimental uh, endeavor that just, again, it just fascinates me. Um, so, and each of those planes have a very distinctive character. The other thing that uh, is true too, I was telling Jay that, um, Part of what I do for my job is to build wooden boats and uh, historic rep uh, replicas, basically, which are made of wood and they have canvas, you know, for the sails, that sort of thing. Uh, so these early uh, World War One planes are also made of wood and are covered with canvas. So it's kind of a, a lateral move in terms of my interest to um, really get excited about how these planes were built and. Uh, the technology that was kind of happening at an exponential rate during the war. Every two weeks, there was a new innovation um, to try to maintain that upper hand. So, you know. well, I'm also a huge World War One fan, and there's a Balsa USA one six scale pup hanging on the ceiling. Yeah, <laughs> just usually it's right above me when I do the show, but since I've changed the angle to have the bookshelf behind me, it's just in front of me. So, um, and I've got a, a Balsa USA Eindecker and. Uh, just all kinds of uh, airplanes. I've got a little, uh, there's a little foam right here. I've got a little foam airplane that I'm going to be putting together. And it's World War One. Oh, nice. So, oh, nice. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big World War One fan as well. And uh, I was fortunate because I grew up in Florida. And Fantasy of Flight is in Florida. And if anybody oh, sure. doesn't know what Fantasy of Flight is, it's amazing. Kermit Weeks' is aircraft. Kermit. Absolutely. And uh, I, I, every year I paid for a season pass instead of, you know, going and paying, I paid for a season pass and, uh, you know, got to see, I mean, there's two airplanes there, um, from the, uh, what was the name of the movie? The World War One movie that was out that had all, almost all the triplanes were red, except there was one black triplane. Fly boys? Fly Fly boys. Boys. Yeah. Two of the, two of the airplanes from Flyboys are there. And the, oh. the chief test pilot is the one that flew some of the planes in, wow. in the, uh, the movie so the like the plane where he uh it's the dual seat airplane where he flies in and and picks Scudder. up the, the girl yeah. yes yeah. um he the he owned the the um the, the person that that's the the chief flight person for his museum he owns that airplane that's his wow. and he's the one that flew it and then the hero plane is also in the museum Very uh, cool. so, so yeah um in fact it's right here so i have to since i'm talking about fantasy of flight it's not world <laughs> war one but but they actually had the Flying Tigers reunion at Fantasy of Flight. Oh, and I got to, nice. I got a glare there, but I got to meet the Flying Tigers. There's 18 signatures on this print. Wow. Um, and the the airplane that's being pictured, the Flying Tiger, his name is Ken Jernstadt. And he was there. So he <laughs> signed it. 
Um, this is a Stan Stokes print. And then I got all the rest of them to sign it, including Tex Hill, who is the oh, high wow. school ace of the Flying Tigers. So wow. uh, just amazing the stuff that uh, that Kermit, you know, has, Kermit Weeks has. And he's also a very big supporter of RC. He's let RC events take place at his property. And Never. then he actually, yes. And then he actually let a club use part of his land to have an RC field. So he's very supportive very cool. of RC. But uh, going back to World War One, I, I just am amazed, you know, that how in such a short time span from the first ever flight of the Wright brothers to the fact that we were taking aircraft and putting guns on them. Well, even before that, people were, were shooting from them before they yeah. mounted guns. They were yeah. shooting from them and, and just, you know, being involved in, in aerial combat in that way. And then, of course, when they put guns on the airplanes, they had to figure out how not to shoot their propellers off. With that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, right. <laughs> so obviously your love of RC and, and aviation and, and World War One somehow that culminated to you becoming an author uh, about World War One. So take us through how how did that happen? And did did the modeling, uh, you know, aero modeling and did that influence it at all? Or how did that yeah. come about? Yeah, that um, let me think. So um, I think my, uh, in terms of the aircraft, uh, I'd written some articles for model aviation and some other RC magazines. I uh, did a couple for aviation history on the Jenny and the S4, the, the, the Thomas Moore Scout and uh, a couple for air and space magazine as well but so during this process i i, I was basically um i had a lot of friends in the what should one say the uh, restore builders community people that build full-size airplanes and restore them and a lot of buddies uh doing that and so this sort of prompted my interest in in getting into books on um that process on showcasing a lot of these amazing craftspeople that build um, full scale. A lot of them build RC as well, uh, full size airplanes and World War One airplanes. So uh, the first book I did was the the Spad uh, 13 book um, for Schiffer, which uh, I forget when that came out. It was a while ago, but um, this bad boy here, and um, that's old Rhinebeck's Spad 7 on the cover. They're very generous in, in letting letting me use that image, and then the plane that. Uh, uh, I showcased in here one of them. Um, here it is. Uh, let me just. This is a Spad 13 that they're building at. I don't know if you can see that. Um, yeah, we can see it. Golden Age Air Museum in Pennsylvania. It's about two and a half hours from me. My good friend Mike O'Neill uh, is involved in that effort along with uh, Paul Doherty. They're building this. Paul built a beautiful DR1 as well. So um, they're far along. And, and part of the uh, objective of these books. Is to showcase um, these people's, you know, very talented uh, and painstaking uh, process of restoring and building these airplanes. Um, these are new builds, actually. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, so that kind of launched me into the the full scale aircraft books, and uh, one's one grew out of another. I mean, I, I found that I was meeting a lot of people that are in that network, and all of them were building on different, you know, different projects. Um, and of course, with with the Casemate series, the uh, the uh, design, construction, innovation books, uh, like the one that Jay reviewed on the British aircraft, I had to come up with a different angle because there had been a lot of really great books um, written about these airplanes, um, largely focusing on sort of their operational histories, uh, the aces, that sort of thing. But nobody kind of really touched in much detail on the construction, which being a model builder. And a boat builder and all of that. I love wood. I built furniture. I built pretty much anything you can make out of wood. I built it. But so my love of building things um, sort of funneled me in that direction for those books. And I got to meet a lot of really cool people. The German uh, aircraft book, there was a guy, Achim Engels, over in Germany who builds nothing but Fokker replica aircraft. Uh, he's featured in that book, in the German book. Um, uh, Coleman May Mayroffer. Uh, builds albatross replicas over in Austria. I got to dialogue with him. He sent me a bunch of interesting pictures uh, of his aircraft uh, that they're all flying replicas. So that's really the cool part about those books and sort of uh, also deconstructing how these airplanes, everyone knows they're great airplanes, but why? I mean, what are the construction innovations uh, and details that made them such great airplanes? I mean, the, of course, the Fokker wing, right, with the 
cantilevered spars and you know no rigging um huge breakthrough and that whole process that's covered in, you know in this book uh from prototyping to early days of sort of um metrics you know stress stress testing wings stress testing fuselages and that was all done very in a very primitive fashion by today's standards i mean sandbags right draped over a wing uh to see if they would break <laughs> <laughs> um, now we have elaborate calculations and computers to do that for us. Um, but back then it was very much kind of like, let's figure this out. Cause guess what? This plane just fell apart, uh, <laughs> in the sky. So, uh, anyway, um, that's kind of how that, that got started. And one book grew out of another and now I'm, I'm, I'm pretty busy, <laughs> pretty busy with these books. <laughs> well, well, obviously there's a lot more we're going to talk about, about your books, but I think, um, you, talking about your your model building, I think we have a, a photo we can share of you uh, or your shop of some of the airplanes that you have built because you've built several. So tell, take us through the the airplanes here in this photo. Okay, so I think that's a on the in the foreground on the right. That's a um, Albatross D three. Uh, I'm trying to remember whose kit that was. That was a kit. Um, I think it was either it may have been Peter Rake or it may have been Aerodrome RC. I think it's a a one eighth scale. Um, and uh, just a fun airplane to build and fly. The Albatross, if you keep them light enough, they fly really, really well and gracefully. They, they have very few poor characteristics, except you really have to use the rudder in the turn, like most World War I airplanes, but especially with the Albatross, because the, the empennage, the horizontal stabilizer, isn't as wide as most aircraft. It's very short, so it kind of likes to you know drag its butt through a turn. So you really, really have to stay on the rudder. Uh, with that particular airplane. The one on the left, as you, you, I'm sure you recognize, the Fokker DR1, that's a VK kit. Uh, very challenging and very scale airplane. The, the airfoil is very accurate when compared to the original Fokker drawings. And it, it's a joy to fly. It's not a joy to land. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a joy to land, especially on sort of tallish grass. It will go right over on its nose. Uh, anyway, um, but it's a very, in the air, it's very nimble. It rolls like crazy. I mean, it uh, has no bad characteristics. They're great fun. Anybody who's flown a triplane model knows what a, what a joy they are to fly in the air. Um, so, yeah, those two were, um, you know, I think the the the, v, the VK uh, DR1 is one sixth, and I, as, as I mentioned, I think this one is one eighth in the foreground. And um, I hand painted that little dragon on the on the fuselage and. Uh, a lot of super detailing of the engine and the cockpit and that sort of thing. And I think all the control surfaces are pull pole uh, wire. So that was fun. Um, also as a scale, can't really see it, but um, the servo for the uh, aileron is in the lower wing with two wires going up on this bell crank that actuates uh, the ailerons, just like the real aircraft. So um, it's fun to kind of uh, play with that. The problem, the problem with that, the downside of that is the, after a while, the line, the, the, key, the cable on the aileron stretches so the, the aileron response is a little sluggish so um i might have to bite the bullet and go back and just put a regular old servo in the top wing with a, <laughs> a rod to that to get the sort of punchy uh, response that i prefer so yeah well i love the dragon on the side i mean obviously there was some great um you know oh, yeah. illustrations and artwork on the airplanes and i i really like the dragon and it's interesting when i when you sent me the photo i didn't know it was possibly aerodrome rc because i had one of their Fokker dr1s uh -huh. um i think the gentleman's name was it kurt bingston am i right yes kurt that's right yeah so i mean that's going back many years because i've been here for 14 years i've worked for ama for 14 years and that was way before that in florida that i had the dr1 so you know probably close to 20 years ago yeah Oh, they're still great kits. I mean, they still sell them. I think through uh, Manzano Laser Works. Okay. You can still get you can still get those kits. Um, and it's just, I mean, every kit build, every kit producer is different in kind of their idiosyncrasies and what they choose to focus on. And um, those aerodrome kits are, are really nice. I have a, a Newport 27. I think it's eighth scale. I love that airplane. I just I I fly it all the time. It's so maneuverable and um, it's very scale. So it has. Uh, some of the bad characteristics too, but you know, it's not excessively strong. So you can't do crazy stuff or you rip the wings off. But um, anyway, um, those are a lot of fun to build and uh, pretty affordable price point by today's standard too. So yeah. I think we've got a, a photo of one of your other models. I believe it's a flight photo of a SPAD. 
Yes, that's a um, so that was a lot of fun. That's um, Brooks uh, Spad uh, 13. That was a Peter Rake kilt a kit that I um, extensively modified. Uh, cockpit details. It has the little bell cranks in the lower wing that actuates the with a push rod to the aileron, just like in the real Spads and scale rigging, which is very difficult on a Spad. It's got all that uh, crazy bracing between the inner planes and the fuselage and those um, those. They're not really true interplanes that bisect the wings. They're more like struts to keep the the flying wires and landing wires from vibrating in a dive. That's kind of what those were for. Um, anyway, but this was a, a great a great build, a lot of fun. I, it has a sound card in it from a Hispano Suizo engine, which so when you fly it around, it sounds approximates the sound of the Spad flying, um, which is great fun. And it's a one sixth electric, so um, electrics are nice because they're. They're clean. You don't have, I mean, especially with a, with a lot of scale work, you don't have to clean glow fuel or whatever, you know, off those surfaces, uh, rigging in small parts, that kind of thing, which is problematic at best. So electrics make a really good power system for you know, super scale jobs. That big Newport that I was telling you, I was telling Jay about earlier, um, that's about 36 pounds. It's a third scale Newport 11. That's got an electric engine in it. It's the biggest electric engine I could find, and I think 12 cells and flight time about five minutes. Um, but uh, I think I might change that over to a multi-cylinder gas or glow because you just can't get the flight time. Big airplanes, by the time you make maybe two circuits of the flying field, it's time to land So because they go so slow. They're so draggy. But uh, anyway. <laughs> so how many uh, aircraft model aircraft from World War One do you have? about 30 i think wow uh, yeah i've got a lot it's 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 a problem <laughs> <laughs> i just can't get rid of them each one of them has uh has special memories tied to them and um they all fly differently which is really nice um they do i mean i was telling you some of the characteristics of the albatross they're all different um spads flies different from newports and newports from fockers and all of that so that's the cool thing about if you get a real scale airframe, those characteristics really come out. Um, oftentimes kit designers will make a, you know, a pretty standard Clark White airfoil or something that will fly really well, uh, no problems in the sky. But if you go back to those under cambered airfoils that are really skinny, with a lot of bracing, it's a challenge to get the airplane to fly, first of all, because you know, you've got all, all this stuff that's gonna, you know, the, the wires serve as a structural component of, if you don't put those in, the things will just fill up. So that's kind of fun um, to as, as a challenge, a building challenge, and then to see how they actually fly is a whole other whole other ball game. So uh, yeah, so yeah, I have well, a lot. Well, that's okay because our our friend from Balls USA, Joe Vermillion, says he sees no problem with the number of aircraft that you have. <laughs> well, good. I thank you, Joe, because I I do have several. Balsa USA planes, two of which I haven't built yet, a quarter scale Newport 28 and a quarter scale DR1. So they're on the list. And uh, I just finding the time is the always the tough part with the full time job and children and all the rest. But uh, <laughs> anyway, we'll get to it. <laughs> well, I have to ask as someone that's, you know, involved in RC and, and specifically World War One, and then you write World War One books. Do you have a favorite World War One aircraft? Oh, gosh. Gosh, you know, I love spads. I do. I don't know why. Um, I love Newports. I, I guess the answer is no, because I like them all for different reasons. They all have such individual character. I mean, you look at a an Albatross compared to an SE-5A, very different airplane, or a, or a Fokker D7 compared to a Newport 11. I mean, they're all so very different. Same with World War II. You know, they all have, those planes all had a tremendous amount of character. Spitfire versus a Fock Wolf or a ME 109, they're all very different qualities and characters. And that's kind of what I like. These these planes have personalities, right? And they have personalities as static objects, just as beautiful things, but they also have personalities in the air. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes if you don't respect those personalities, <laughs> the plane will go down. <laughs> yeah. So that's an important, that's a challenge too, you know, so. So when it comes to the actual flying of your World War I models, is there a, a specific one that you seem to fly the most, or do they all get fairly equal flight times? i got to say I love the Newport line of fighters. I, I, I And 
and the uh, Fokker D7 is, is a wonderful plane to fly. Albatross too. Um, I love flying my Newport 27, my little eighth scale thing. It's so uncomplicated when you talk about quarter scale, third scale, there's a lot of setup time involved with those. And you want to do all the safety checks that, that you would want because it's a big piece of, it's a big thing in the air. You don't want something to go wrong and somebody to get injured or for the plane to get destroyed or whatever. So much more um, labor intensive to go through the pre, pre-flight checks for those bigger airplanes. Smaller planes, throw them in the back of your car, you're at the field, plug in a battery or, or you know, a small glow engine, fire that up and off you go. Um, yeah, I mean, the, uh, you mentioned, Jay, you have the 1-6 uh, Sopwith Pup. Also yeah. say, I also have that airplane and I love flying that. That's a yes. very fun airplane, very gentle airplane, such a pleasure to land. It just floats right in. I mean, it makes you makes makes us look good because <laughs> it's right. doing it's doing the work. It's just, you know, you get, it approaches so slow and gentle and just touches down and boy, you could drink a cup of coffee while you're landing that thing. <laughs> mine, which is just hanging up right above me here, mine has Betty on the side. And I chose oh. that scheme because my great aunt, who sadly passed away last year, she built uh, Curtis Helldivers during World War II, and her name's wow. Betty. And then my mother's name is also Betty. So wow. I chose that specific scheme. But, you know, that's what I love about, um, air, you know, RC modeling or, you know, any type of aero modeling is there's so many choices. It's like a yeah. blank, like an artist, a blank canvas, you know, okay, I'm going to do a stop with pup. Which one do I want to do? There's yeah. so many. And that's why it's great to have books like yours and other books like yours to give us scale documentation, you know, whether we compete in scale or we just want to build a scale airplane, it's great to have that documentation and figure out a scheme. It, it absolutely is. Yeah. That's, that's another aspect of these books. I didn't really even talk about yet, but um, Ronnie Barr does the illustrations of the different profiles in there. So he's a very gifted artist and I'm trying to find one for you, um, in this book. And, uh, he always picks very interesting, um, color schemes for his profiles. And I'm just trying to pull one up here. Come on, Ronnie, where are you, buddy? Um, dead air. Okay. Just the, uh, give me one second. And I will, yeah, here we go. So here's three on a page. Um, so he picks interesting airplanes, interesting um, uh, subjects to depict. And, uh, you know, the, the books, these, these particular books are just uh, about 12 color profiles in them, which give you some suggestions for, you know, different paint schemes. And like I said, we try to pick ones that are not your mainstream you know, everybody's seen Ernst Dudet's Low and that sort of thing uh, for the for the Fockers and his Albatross. But try to pick maybe lesser known pilots that had very interesting, colorful um, schemes that uh, are not your average types of things. So the British aircraft, they tend to be a little bit more conservative in terms of their paint treatment than the, the Germans. Uh, the Germans with the you know, Richthofen's Flying Circus. I mean, they really got out of every paint they could <laughs> fine to doll up those uh, triplanes and those albatrosses but um you know the french also had some pretty wild schemes as well that uh, are fun to uh fun subjects for a model yeah and, and we're fortunate in that we have a lot of um like cali graphics for example yes uh, does a very fine job she, she, they're very easy to work with I, I did a small newport or i'm sorry spad seven and bill thaw from the lafayette escadrille in his livery and I sent her very, I think, uh, cursory information. She pulled together a nice set of markings. They were very affordable and they look great on the airplane. They just go on beautifully. Um, so that we're fortunate that we have companies like that to uh, help us with some of those markings and details if we don't want to paint them ourselves. So we uh, have a, a viewer that asked the name of the book again. They missed that. Uh, and obviously you've, you've written uh, several books, but I think they're inquiring about the, you wrote in a book about German aircraft and then you wrote a book about British aircraft that I reviewed in the magazine. Right. There it and, is. Uh, and you said it was okay to mention that you're working on another book in this yeah. series and it's on yeah. French aircraft. Correct. Yeah. So the, um, there's a lot of information available if you know where to look for it on the German and the uh, British aircraft. Um, as I mentioned, I had to ferret out uh, Achim Engels over in Germany who builds the Fokker replicas. He had a lot of 
photographs that I'd never seen before of the Fokker factory. And they're in here. I'm going to see if I can pull one up um, while we're talking. Uh, he was very, he was invaluable. Um, yeah, here's some. Look at these. Um, these are, this guy down here is testing a cockpit. He's one of the engineers. Um, and these are working on some of the early cantilevered wings. I'd never seen these images before. And Akeem said, just go ahead and use them, credit me. And, you know, it's better that it's out there and people are, you know, are, are aware, aware of it than hiding in some envelope somewhere. So that was awesome because that's usually not the response I get uh, from people. They usually museums, you know, charge. Um, oh, well, well, thank you, Joe. <laughs> yeah, the um, and then the British one, same deal. I mean, um, if you were asking about that, Jay did a very nice review of that in December's Model Aviation. So you can uh, read all about that. And then these other two are shipper books. They're all available on Amazon or you can get them off my website either way. Um, if you get them off my website, it will sign it for you. <laughs> <laughs> so you can get a signed copy. That's really the only advantage uh, there. So um, anyway. Uh, you you wrote another book that we haven't talked about yet. And I told you before we started the show about neuroses. And our museum director has your book. Yes. So yeah. um, I didn't know that you had written that book. And I'm, I'm interested to learn a little bit more about the subject matter. So could you just kind of give us an, an overview about what you learned and you know what people might find in that book? Well, sure. So the, the title of the book is a little misleading. Air neurosis, um, it, that, is a, that is a true medical term, and it's basically any kind of neuro, neurological or psychological problem brought on by flying. Really what the book is about, though, is that's part of it, but it's really about um, kind of the shock to the system, uh, the nervous system, the psyche of the average person. Um, you have to understand, the, the pilots that flew and fought in the First World War um, they came, many of them came from very rural, very peaceful environments, farm country, small towns. Um, they were completely unprepared for the onslaught of uh, full bore mechanized warfare on the Western front. You know, the enemy was often described as faceless because they were in trenches, poisonous gas, uh, airplanes, tanks, all of this stuff, epic artillery that seemed to come from out of nowhere. It was this faceless enemy. And of course, the casualty, nine, nine million, I mean, casualty was just um, staggering by any standard. I mean, the only comparable is the American Civil War in terms of uh, casualties. But uh, so anyway, the shock to the system, um, airplanes, I mean, we had just, um, I mean, airplanes were barely invented. 1903, uh, you know, moving forward uh, to 1914, where now we're, as Jay was mentioning earlier, um, you know, airplanes were seen as, an extension of the Observer Corps. They were used to sort of recon. And from that, combat grew out of that because people started, you know, seeing opposing uh, opposing aircraft flying over the front, doing the same thing. People started throwing shoes at each other, uh, pistol shots. Some people strapped shotguns to the side of it before they got into a point-and-shoot weapon at the end of the war with a uh, machine gun, you know, oriented on the longitudinal ac axis of the fuselage, just sort of sight down the gun barrel and fire very different. That happened in just four years. Pretty amazing. But anyway, these pilots, um, there's about, I think, five or six profiled. Mick Manick uh, flew for the uh, RFC. Uh, very interesting case study on him. He, uh, he repressed a lot of the anguish and problems that he experienced. He was terrified of burning to death in his plane. And ironically, that's just how he died. His SE-5A Caught fire, he was doing one of the things he told his, his pupils, his students never to do, which is to fly low over the line and uh, hot shots at his aircraft that hit the fuel tank and rolled over and burst into flames. And that's how he died. He was obsessed with that and talks about it uh, a lot. But because he, you know, nowadays we have uh, flight surgeons to help pilots cope with this, um, talking through their problems is, actually helps them heal faster. Well, they didn't do this. This was seen as counterproductive in the RFC. If you had a problem with flying, you were you were you kept to yourself because you were going to basically undermine morale if you talked about it with your fellow pilots or your commanding officer. So um, this actually made the problem more acute and um, debilitating. Um, so there's that. Uh, per perhaps the person that fared the best in the book is Ernst Dudet, who was able to. He talks about having difficulties early with. Um, killing his fellow man in the air 
and how he knew that if he didn't do it quickly, he would just become a coward and that would be it. And he basically talks about killing himself if that happened, which prophetically is what what he did in the Second World War. Anyway, um, that's another story. But uh, so each of these pilots um, suffered differently and had different ways of coping with it. So um, uh, it's just fascinating. Most of the comments I hear about this book is many people didn't realize this happened so early. They, they more associate it with, say, the Second World War or certainly Vietnam, uh, for sure. So uh, they didn't realize that this was happening so early um, in the uh, warfare warfare experience, shall we call it. Um, so, yeah, so the book talks a little bit about um, each of these pilots, these different case studies, and then the context, um, how, all, like, as, as I mentioned, this coalescing of all of these technologies at the front that sort of assaulted, I mean, to the ground troops, they called it shell shock. This is kind of what the, the sort of doppelganger in the air is about, sort of the shell shock in the air to um, watching your comrades um, fall in flames or, you know, no parachutes back then, right? So you either jumped out of your airplane, use the French parachute, which is a pistol under your seat, much better than burning to death, um, or you went down in flames. So um, <laughs> kind of a, a reality check when you, when you think about it with compared to today's training and today's uh, extensive training of our pilots worldwide, uh, how this sort of started out. Um, so anyway... <laughs> <laughs> that was that that was mentioned in the movie Flyboys that we just talked about the about the Lafayette Escadrille. Uh, I think one of the characters wanted to know why they were issued pistols, and that was why. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that's your those are your two choices: jumping to death or burning to death. Well, or a painless way, quick and painless. So um, yeah, that was that definitely an option if you wanted to do that. Um, so yeah, again, diff very different. Actually, Ernst to death. So. Germans were issued parachutes late in the war, and I cover this in the book. He talks about being in his D-7, flying, and the elevator controls, the linkages, the elevators were shot out. So his, his D-7 drops straight down, right? And he's going down. He's like, all right, well, I guess I'm about to kiss my butt goodbye because <laughs> without elevator control, there's no way I'm coming out of this dive. And then he remembered, wait, I'm wearing a parachute. So what does he do? He gets, stands up in the cockpit, un unbuckles his harness, stands up in the cockpit, Pulls the ripcord, gets sucked out of his cockpit, and the canopy of the parachute gets caught on the tail of his D7. So he's <laughs> he's trailing behind it. He claims in the book he took the shrouds and climbed up to the canopy in this dive, unhooked it, and that saved him. Parachute open, he was safe. And I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a heck of a story. <laughs> well. I actually have a model of his uh, D7 in the bookshelf right behind me, and I've got his book. Uh, I mean, I have several. Under the Black Cross. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got yeah. several. Um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but you mentioned about how he felt about, you know, being in aerial dogfights and killing his fellow man. I believe there's a story where he was in a dogfight and his opponent's guns jammed and Udet had the chance to shoot him down and instead saluted him and flew away because he didn't feel right about shooting him down since he couldn't fight back. Uh, was, are you familiar with that? Yeah, that, that was, that was uh, uh, George Guinemé, the French ace. I uh, was flying, uh, I think it was a Spad 7, and yeah, that was flying an albatross, and his guns jammed, and Guinemé basically saluted him and peeled off because he realized it wasn't a fair fight. And, you know, Udet says in his book that he's convinced that that wasn't just a fluke, that there are some that say, well, Guinemé's uh, guns jammed too, that's why he, that's why I broke off the engagement. But no, your dad was convinced it was it was aerial chivalry, basically, in short, that there was honor in the sky, that uh, uh, that was the nice thing about, you know, fighting in the, in the sky as opposed to trench warfare. You actually knew your opponent, your opponent's planes. It's much more intimate. And um, so you more of this sort of it's been overblown that this sort of aerial jousting night for night, that kind of thing that's been played up quite a bit. Uh, you know, you, you talk to somebody like Mick Manick and he was like, nope, he goes, uh, he goes, he was very, uh, he said this idea of being these uh, chivalry and stuff is just overrated. And he goes, by the end of the war, it's, you know, um, it was very much codified into a very uh, uh, formulaic practice of attacking and uh, in group formations and shooting down your opponent. That sort of early engagements where it was one-on-one -on -one, was very different by the end of the war. Um, uh, actually, 
Eddie Rickenbacker, America's great ace, called dogfighting by the close of the, of the First World War scientific murder. That's how he phrased it, his exact words, because it was so uh, planned and choreographed in terms of how you would attack and shoot down that there was really nothing left uh, for individual you know, maneuvering or expression. It was, very, it was very strict and very codified by the end of the war. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I asked you, Mark, before uh, we started the program that I find very interesting is, you know, it must be difficult writing about aviators and aircraft that no one that flew them and you know, no one that built them is still living. And I remember having this conversation with aeronaut books and I asked them because they had done a, a story about a gentleman named Berthold and there was rumors that he had been um, strangled using his blue max at some kind of uprising. And they said, no, that's not true. He was actually shot at the uprising. And I said, well, how do you know that? I mean, not that I was disputing what they said, but I was like, how, you know, how do you figure that out? Or how do you know that? And, and they said that they would buy, they buy newspapers on, you know, wherever eBay, wherever they buy newspapers from all the countries every day, if they can find them, they buy newspapers and they corrected the story that he wasn't strangled. He was shot. It was based huh. off of newspapers that they bought at the time that it huh. actually happened. So I'm curious from, you know, from your perspective and what you're writing about, I mean, obviously, as you just mentioned, when you were writing about the, the book we just discussed uh, about neuroses, you, I'm sure read some of the other pilots books, the people that either left a journal or wrote a book, but, you know, generally speaking, uh, you know, how hard is that to, to write a book when you can't ask anybody that was there? Yeah, it is. It's tough. You have to basically extrapolate using, if you have like primary source documents, like their own letters, their own writings about their experiences. Um, that's very helpful because it's their voice talking, but you also have to bear in mind, even with even though they're writing about it, you have to bear in mind that the context in which they're writing it um, often is under duress, uh, often, um, or if it's many years later, it's retrospective. So they tend to burnish things or embellish things that maybe they wouldn't have if you know at the time. Uh, Udet does that quite a bit, and um, some of the others too, uh, when they're writing, you know, they're sort of you know, as, as time goes by, you tend to, everyone does this, tend to romanticize things. You forget some of the really awful stuff and you tend to romanticize uh, some of the positive aspects to make it a better memory for yourself <laughs> and to make a good story because who doesn't like a good story? But um, anyway, uh, yeah, it it's tough. I mean, I, with that Air Neurosis book, actually consulted uh, with uh, flight surgeons at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base uh, about modern problems that pilots have. And it was very, very enlightening to talk about. Well, he said, well, you know, PTSD is, is alive and well, that'll never go away. As long as people kill, kill each other, that's, that's always going to be a problem. And so they were very uh, forthcoming and enlightening about kind of modern, even with the best training, even with the best equipment and safety features and all of that, um, you still, you still run into problems uh, with the human psyche. So, um, you know, I, I said, well, these pilots that I profiled, and he said, well, by today's Air Force standards, these guys would have all washed out. As a matter of fact, well, not all of them, but a lot of them. And Matt, as a matter of fact, uh, Mick Manick had a bum eye. And what he did before taking his medical exam to be a pilot, he went into the medical building the night before, he broke in, he memorized the chart for his eye exam. <laughs> went back the next day, recited it from rote, got his ticket. And that was that. But uh, that's kind of <laughs> that kind of stuff. I don't know if it's I doubt it still goes on. I doubt it's possible. But um, those types of things uh, happened back then. So it was easier to get in a cockpit. You mentioned the Lafayette Escadre. Yeah, those guys often bluff their way, like saying, sure, I can fly that plane. Uh, actually, I forget who it was. And I'm trying to I'll remember in a minute, probably right after I sign off. One of the guys said, yeah, I can fly that. Not a problem. Got in the plane, crashed into the side of a barn. <laughs> he didn't know how to fly. He just was like, you know, well, I can do it. Yeah, he said that sort of, you know, hubris, that sort of arrogance that I can do it. Eventually, he did learn how to fly, but he wanted to get in that cockpit really bad and just, you know, uh, I must say back then the, the romance of flight and the, the draw, uh, the extreme attraction to it was very pronounced. I mean, it was something so new and so spectacular, like going to space. For us in the late 1960s, I mean, for them getting up and flying in an aircraft, and you know, 
anyway, beyond the scope of imagination for, for most folks. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned space because, you know, I talked about how we have members who, um, you know, all walks of life. So there's who Gibson five time. Oh, uh, sure. Five space shuttle missions, four times as the commander. He's the gentleman that shook hands with the Russian cosmonaut in space. And the president said that was the end of the Cold War. I mean, he's nice. a MA member and he's been our ambassador. And and the other gentleman with him in this this cover is uh, he was a, is a fighter pilot. He's retired now. But um, Captain Tom Huff and now he works in the aviation in the civilian side in aviation. Both of them members. This actually we released this magazine right before AMA Expo. And I went to the AMA Expo and got them both to sign it. Um, Very nice. That's Very Tom's nice. jet in the background. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing. Um, and, you know, aviation, obviously, we all appreciate it. Anybody that's in this hobby has an appreciation. And a lot of us have an appreciation for the history. And that's why books like yours are so great um, to learn things, to, you know, get those aircraft profiles to help with designing our aircraft. I mean, for me. If I get an airplane, I want to know as much as I can find about the airplane. If I decide to model an airplane after a certain, you know, I want to know about the pilot. Or even if it's like an ARF, if I buy a plane from yeah. Horizon Hobby, I want to know, well, you know, and that's how I found out about Berthold because I had a World War One German aircraft and it was modeled after his aircraft. And so I was like, well, I want to learn about, you know, about him. So, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier when I was talking to the gentleman who's going to be our uh, one of our free flight columnists, and I asked him, so what's it like going into a Barnes and Noble or a Target or, or wherever and seeing your books? And, and I wonder that for, for you too, Mark. I mean, what's it like to see books that you wrote? I mean, just like people, like, uh, you know, any company, you know, Balls USA, you know, when they go to a World War One event or any event and see their airplanes, I mean, obviously there's some pride in that. So, you know, how how did that feel for you? And especially like the first time that, you know, you wrote a book and you actually saw it on Amazon or you saw it in a bookstore. I mean, what's that like as an author? Yeah. So it's very gratifying. I'll, I'll, yeah. I mean, there's no two ways about it. Um, and you do, it's funny because I remember the first book I wrote was a maritime history book, the Cape Cod's uh, oldest shipwreck on the Sparrowhawk, which crossed the Atlantic in 1626 from England to Massachusetts. Anyway, that was the first book I published. That was 2011. And I, unbeknownst to me, my local library had acquired it. So <laughs> I'm at the library looking for another book. I'm thumbing through the maritime history section. <laughs> and there's my book. And I'm like, it's got the little code on the bottom with the library information. I'm like, oh my God. I was like, look at that. So that that's a that's a real treat. That's special. That that uh, that never gets old. Um, you know, my the aviation books. A couple of air neurosis and, and I think the British, no, the German book is at my local library here in Maryland. And I go in and I, with the kids to get, you know, kid books, you know, T spot run, whatever. And I point that out to them. And they, it's really fun to see the expression on their face uh, when, when you point that out. So, um, yeah, it's a treat. It is a treat. It's very gratifying. I have a, a, a similar story. I mean, obviously, sometimes I see model aviation and that's awesome. But a, a similar story is, uh, the whole publications department took a field trip to the Dayton Air Force Museum. And yeah. Michael Smith, who I, I mentioned, our, yeah, fantastic museum. So Michael Smith, our, our museum, uh, you know, he's in charge of our museum. He, his mother actually gives tours. She actually works there and gives tours of wow. the museum. So he set it up for us in advance that she would give us the tour. So the whole publications department goes to the Dayton Air Force Museum. Of course, I've been there a handful of times because it's just amazing. But it was really cool to go, you know, kind of as a a, a work trip to see all these aircraft. And, and so Michael, um, our museum director's mother, gives us the tour. And so we're in the gift shop, right? And I'm, of course, I've got to look at books. So as I mentioned, my great aunt built Curtis Helldivers in World War II wow. in Columbus, Ohio. And the daughter of one of the people that, she, so they rented a house. There was a few of them that rented a house. And one of the ones that lived with my aunt, her daughter wrote a book about them, about the Curtis cadets. And that book was in the Dayton Air Force Museum. And wow. what's even more interesting than that is my aunt and her mother and many of them went to aeronautical engineering at Purdue. They sent them to Purdue, which, oh, wow. you know, is very close here in Indiana. And I, so the author came to Purdue to get research material for the book. And so I met her there and she huh. gave a, 
presentation. And I was asked to speak from the viewpoint of my aunt and my experience with the magazine. So at the end of the, the, the um, presentation, they took a photo of the two of us together and she put that photo in the book. So here I am at the Dayton Air Force Museum with all my coworkers. And I'm like, wow, there's that book. So I pull it out and I open to the page that has, I knew my picture was in it. And I just showed it to my coworkers. I said, check this out. You know, look at this book. And I open the page and there's a picture of me with the author. And, you know, I'm nice. that's, you know, that feeling I'm sure is similar to your feeling, you know, when you see it's just, just pride and, you know, it's just excitement and, and happy that people are enjoying, you know, what you do, just like with us putting the magazine together, you know, we're happy that uh, our members and readers like it and appreciate it. And there's pride in that. So, um, and just like, you know, Balsa USA or any of the, the kit manufacturers, when they go to events and see their aircraft. Um, oh yeah. It's a oh, labor yeah. of love, right? It totally is. Totally is. And it's, and you, you mentioned an interesting point earlier about does the, do the models influence or inform the books on the full size aircraft? And yes, they do, because you're able, once you've built a model of a, of an air, a scale model of an airplane, World War One or otherwise, you're intimately familiar with how that plane is put together, every stick of it. And uh, often the, especially with World War One, the construction of the model mirrors that of the full size airplane in terms of placement of longerons, struts, all of that stuff, uh, firewall, all of the you know, spacing of the ribs and the spars, all of that stuff is very, very, very similar to the real aircraft. So when you're writing about it, it really helps to have that in your head, you know, how that thing's put together. And it, it really does help a lot. I think one of the first things I do with these, uh, with these books, if, if there's a particular plane that I, that I don't understand or that, uh, is, is foreign to me. I will I will often build a model of it just to just to understand it better and be able to write more fluidly about it. So, you know. so just uh, I'm sure I, I would be curious to hear those of us obviously that don't write books on on full scale aviation. I mean, I know it, I'm sure it varies on the topic and the amount of research you have to do. But I mean, ballpark realistically, how long does it take to do all the research and write a book? Wow, that's a tough one. I, you know, I, I should keep track, and I, probably I don't keep track because I'd be depressed. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it takes, you know, these casemate books. The these guys, um, these take over a year, uh, working part time, and sometimes um, weekends, holidays, you know. So, and then when you get into the run up to production, as you know, Jay, deadlines are deadlines, right? So um, you really need to. I take time off sometimes to uh, to finish up, and you know your final edits are always grueling because you want to catch everything. Um, so that's uh, that's really when you feel the heat. But yeah, they take anywhere from a year to two. I mean, Air Neurosis took about two years. That started with an article called "Dark Side of Glory" in Air and Space Magazine, and grew into this book because after writing that article, I found I had so much other material. You know supplemental material it was it was enough for a book so uh it just depends i mean research you have to enjoy it right because research i find research fascinating it's a treasure hunt you're trying to ferry ferret out these little bits of information that'll make the whole thing come together uh and make sense so uh you know and your research takes you all over the place it's just amazing and a lot of these pilots and builders that help with these books are, are a wealth of information uh and i think i'm trying to remember his name he built an SE5A. He's building an SE5A down in Australia. Um, what's his name? Anyway, it's in the book. He uh, was able to have really good insight into the way that was built. He said the SE5A is very much a Royal Aircraft Factory uh, over-engineered design. I mean, every aspect of that airplane is over-engineered. And uh, anyway, it's just, it's fascinating to hear that versus like building a Sopwith Camel, uh, what, what's involved with that. So um, these builders really do give you because they're building from original plans, give you like boots on the ground information about how these planes went together or how, how difficult it was to fabricate the fittings or whatever the challenge is. So that's another source of information that it's not period, but it is, uh, relevant because as I mentioned, they're working from original builders drafts and following the spec. So, um, they're encountering the problems that were encountered back then. So, no. Well, it's it's definitely you know fascinating. I'm sure you, you we were talking earlier. You have quite the aviation book collection beyond your own books, and oh yeah, I have quite the collection as well. And 
um, you know, wish I had more time to read them all, but it, <laughs> there's, exactly. there's just so much uh, neat information. And, uh, you know, you mentioned Casemate and they've been um, very uh, nice to provide us a lot of books uh, over the years. And, uh, you know, it's interesting when I reviewed your book in the December issue, I didn't reach out to them and ask them like, hey, Mark has written for us. And I know, Mark, can you can you provide us? Oh. They said, hey, you want to review Mark's book? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Well, well, so you, you're already in the pipe. So with the French book, I'll give that a nudge too, and I'll have them send you a copy of that. Um, yes, so, absolutely. Yeah. And, and and as I mentioned earlier in the show, I'll be re reviewing the book about uh, the Battle of Britain, um, That's cool. making of the movie that comes out in August. Who doesn't that, like that movie, right? <laughs> yeah. So one last thing I want to talk to you about. We're we're almost out of time, but you yeah. know, you talked a little bit about the Lafayette Escadrille, and I didn't know. I talking about the Dayton Air Force Museum. I was invited to see a movie a few years ago and you share with me before the show that you were involved in the making of that movie. So could you share a little bit about that and that project and let people know that that's going to be available soon so people could buy the yeah. DVD or the Blu-ray? That's right. So um, yeah, I was basically a uh, historical, con historical consultant uh, and uh, one of the model makers, model, model people for the movie. And um, it was a project that spanned, I think four years. And um you know, I was up in Massachusetts on Cape Cod when it began, uh, building a couple planes for the movie, and then moved down to Maryland to take this job, the Calvin Ray Museum. And um, so I had to bring all of that, the planes that were still in progress down here and set up a shop and finish them and blah, blah, blah. So um, that was uh, uh, a logistical nightmare. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, the film involves full-size aircraft, uh, shots of full-size aircraft and I was involved with coordinating some of those pilots and aircraft for those shoots and um then model aircraft and um i think they went they went all over the place uh to main, mainly the the two producers the two directors of the movie paul glenshaw who's a dear friend of mine and Derek greer um they were kind of the writers for the movie and i was involved more in sort of the technical um if they needed historical stuff like we went and interviewed one of my professors at grad school uh, who's the, the guy who taught the World War One course that I love so much. And um, we did stuff like that. So um, uh, it was a very interesting project. And you really, you see the finished project and all just sort of flows together seamlessly, but there's just so much work of raw footage, B-roll, all this stuff that you have to call through. And I didn't do any of that. I, I you know, that was Derek and, and Paul and, and the editor. But um, yeah, it's it was an interesting project. We were out at Dayton actually for, their Dawn Patrol rendezvous, God, that was way before COVID. That was like four years ago. And we filmed um, some of those airplanes flying uh, as, as part of the movie as well. So, yeah, I'm trying to make all the pieces, the full-size aircraft, the model aircraft, flow together in a, in a segment. Is, it takes, it's an art. It is. So, yeah. yeah, I love that show, the Dawn Patrol show at the Dayton Air Force Museum. They usually have it every two years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 phenomenal. You get the full scale and the models, and uh, so and I even one year I went and uh, a, one of our members, his name is Billy. He had his Balsa USA. It was done up like Ernst Dudet, and he let me fly it at the Dayton nice. Air Force Museum. So nice. that was thrilling to fly his giant scale um, Udet D7. And wow. uh, yeah, so I would rec highly recommend anyone. Uh, who can make it to that show to go to that show because you get to see the museum. There's lots of vendors there who sell books and artwork. That's where I got my book about Udet, Ernst Udet's, oh, very good. you know, his actual book that he wrote. I got it there. I also, uh, Russell Smith is one of my favorite aviation oh, artists. Oh, sure. I, I, and I, he goes I there. And so right off camera over here, I've got, he actually did a pencil drawing, a sketch of the, the Red Baron. And I have that. Yeah that nice. Russell Smith did. And then I have, he did a print where the Red Baron is shooting down an SC5 and he does it from the perspective of behind the Red Baron's DR1. So it's a different perspective, almost like you're kind of in, in the moment of the artwork and uh, it's called bringing the guns to bear. So I nice. have that print and then I have his hand-drawn um, sketch of, uh, of the Red Baron, but yes, it's an, it's a phenomenal show. And it is. 
you know, I mentioned, unfortunately, Dennis Norman passed away, who did our free flight scale column. He would go, he actually would have a booth there, and he was very, very involved in, in aviation history. So I always look forward to seeing Dennis and talking to Dennis at that show. But yes, highly recommend everyone uh, who's able to to go to that show. And I, I've kind of lost track because it's every other year, but I think they didn't have it once because of COVID. So I've, right. I've lost track of when the next one is. But I think it's coming up this fall. Is it? I think, okay. I think, I think so. Late September, early October, right in there. And uh, yeah, the RC component is fabulous there. I think when I, when I was there, there was a half scale Newport, it was either an 11 or a 17 and then a half scale camel. And they were just like, wow. I mean, that size really has some weight to it and gravitas. I mean, you look at these things you're like, wow, that's a big airplane. <laughs> that's a big model airplane. And uh, to see them fly, I mean, it looks, they look, you can't tell them from the real plane. I mean, when they're up there, they're flying so slowly and, and scale. It's just amazing. Anyway. Absolutely. That's why they, that's why they work great on film because you can't really tell, right? Absolutely. So we, we shared it at the bottom of the screen and we also put it in the comments, but just to share one last time, if anybody wants to, to visit your website, it's oh, on the screen now, www.mcwilkins.com. And you also have a, you said you also have a Facebook page. I do which is on the screen as well. And what, what will people find at your Facebook page? Just builds of all my planes, a lot, mostly World War One, almost all World War I. Um, I think that SPAD that you put up is in there. The big, the big uh, third scale Newport's in there, like a lot of the little uh, Albatross D3's in there. They're all in there. Um, so uh, yeah, that's pretty much a model page uh, exclusively. So uh, anyway, it's fun to, it's fun to share. I might mean, love sharing. Uh, what I do with, with other people. And Facebook is a great way to do that. And there's a huge, as you know, a huge Facebook community of builders out there that love to exchange ideas and solve problems. Like what, what engine do you use for that? Or did you find that this was better than that? And this sort of thing, it's a great, great resource for, uh, rather than, you know, slog, slogging it out and <laughs> finding out the hard way that it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate you, uh, um, spending time with us today to talk a bit about uh, your modeling background and the books. And I appreciate you writing all these books that I can fill up my new bookshelf with. Because <laughs> my pleasure. You can't have enough aviation books as far as I'm concerned. So true. So, so true. Um, want to remind everyone about our next show. Our next show is going to be Friday, February 18th. Uh, don't have the guest lined up yet, but obviously we'll let you know before the show. Um, thanks everyone for watching. Thank you, Mark, for being on the Thank show. You, Jay. It's my pleasure. And we'll see everyone again on Friday, February 18th. Okay, very good.